Good morning or afternoon, everyone, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to the Breakbulk Middle East Digital Special. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Liz, and I'm the senior content producer here at Breakbulk. So we're delighted to have you all joining us today virtually and hope that you enjoy the great lineup of sessions over the next couple of days. So before I hand over to our fantastic speakers, I just wanted to briefly explain how this session will run. So we'll start with some opening remarks from the UAE Ministry of Energy and Infrastructure, as well as our other key partners for the event. And after this, we will have a presentation from Mead Projects covering the project outlook in the Middle East before listening to our esteemed panel discussing key challenges and opportunities in the break bulk industry moving ahead into 2021. Finally, we'll be hosting a live Q&A with the panellists, so any questions you do have, please ask them in the Q&A tab and we'll do our best to get to them at the end of the session. So just a couple of points to note is this webinar will be available on demand, so you'll find the link on our website after the session. And as always, we are relying on technology, so please do bear with us if we have any technical glitches. Due to the many restrictions currently in place around the globe, we have a combination of pre-recorded and live content for you today. And we are so thankful to everyone that has been involved in making this happen. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our speakers for the welcome and outlook from the government perspective. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the United Arab Emirates and to the Break Bulk Middle East 2021, which is held virtually this year. 2020 was an exceptional year where the whole world faced COVID-19 pandemic and came out of it hopefully stronger and more resilient. Throughout the year, Break Bulk Middle East conference and exhibition bring us together to see and share our experiences as countries and companies to continuously improve our regulations and equipments in the field of transportation and logistics. For us in the United Arab Emirates, we are always aim to ensure that we provide the best ports and shipping infrastructure to remain on the top quartile of this industry. We are proud that two of our ports were placed among the world's top 50 containers ports. The UAE ports handles more than 12 million containers and receives more than 21,000 vessels annually. Project cargo and break bulk sector is considered one of the most promising sectors in the UAE and will remain to be a major contributor to our economy. During the pandemic, there was a demand shock caused by lockdowns and travel restrictions in many parts of the world. However, the industry returned gradually by embracing technology and utilizing efficient supply chain operations. In the UAE, we worked as one team, supporting our frontline heroes in improving health and safety regulations to cope up with the pandemic and at the same time to ensure a sustainable supply to different regions. Our flexibility and willingness to respond to emergencies throughout years of meticulous planning and successful execution is the primary reason why the industry did not face a major downturn. The sector will indeed witness an uptick in business. The post-COVID-19 era will be marked by the strong rebound, driven mainly by a range of timely measures, strong fundamentals, investment in AI technologies, and financial incentives. Break Bulk Middle East has been a great platform to facilitate dialogue between different stakeholders in the break bulk and project cargo industry. We are optimistic and hopeful that break bulk Middle East digital special will accelerate the recovery of the project cargo industry. 
by uniting experts, competent professionals, and young talent who are the future of the industry. The Ministry of Energy and Infrastructure will continue supporting this event and hopefully welcome all of you in person next year. I'm pleased to be here today participating in Breakbulk Middle East Digital Special, which gathers industry leaders from shipping, ports, ship construction, and offshore marine companies, as well as their international partners, for two days of deep discussion, guidance, and interaction. Since the 1970s, the Saudi government has intended to diversify the economy away from just crude oil experts and more broadly, away from petroleum sector. This has resulted in an increased contribution of non-oil sectors, currently making up to 73% of total GDP. In comparison to 46% of the GDP in the 1970s. Maritime ports in Saudi Arabia have been receiving great attention since their inception under the kingdom's founder, King Abdulaziz. This has formed one of the nation's most important economic and commercial streams. In addition to playing a major role in boosting its regional and international trade. I am glad to witness the efforts of Mawani in transforming the kingdoms into a unique logistics platform in accordance with the vision 2030. For myself, being the first female to get full support and a scholarship from Saudi Arabia and the late King Abdullah was a milestone achievement. With only 2% of the entire international maritime landscape being made up of women, I feel responsible to promote the many benefits which a career in maritime can yield. That is why, as the first UAE ambassador of WESTA, I urge more companies to collaborate for the support of driving more awareness to such a significant subject. Not only will this foster greater growth, it will also empower ambitious like-minded females such as myself and the benefit will be added contributions of value to the maritime sector. On that note, I eagerly look forward for the adv advancements that will be made for the sector as a result of this year Break Bulk Middle East Digital Special. Hello everyone. It's a great honor to be with you all here at this most prestigious event for bulk, Break Bulk and General Cargo in the region. The Break Bulk event has always been a fantastic platform for all type of stakeholders, carriers and customers of general cargo, bulk, break bulk and Roro in the region. We have experienced a great achievements and connections between different parties that has happened in the break bulk event and was, as a, was a result of the meetings and the efforts of people of this uh, prestigious event. We believe that the year uh, of 21 will be a great, uh, will carry a great opportunities. And we believe that the break bulk is the right platform for all people to gather and network and see uh, where we are heading. At Jabal Ali, uh, things have been progressing very fast. We have been, as you know, investing heavily in our infrastructure, in our people, and in our rules and regulations. We have seen a uh, great uh, cargo move uh, in the last year and the previous years. Uh, most of the developments of the huge project that's taking place as we speak in Dubai and in the UAE, most of these cargo have been moving through Jabal Ali. Uh, the Expo 2020 will take place this year and most of the cargo, including the 360 largest dome uh, that will provide a unique experience for all the expo uh, visitors when the uh, event starts have been loaded and discharged in Jabal Ali. We have ensured that all of our customers uh, receive the uh, state-of-art uh, services. 
with a timely manner, with the most efficient way, and protecting their cargo and meet their customers' expectation. For us, we continue to grow our business and we continue to uh, provide all the facilities to our customers in order to help them growing further and cater for the region's expansions that's taking place uh, in, in the region and globally. We do understand our customers' needs. We do uh, invest and continually will invest on our uh, systems, on our regulations. We have always ensured that customers uh, benefiting from uh, the IT uh, services, from the flexibility uh, that we provide while handling uh, their cargo, uh, also all the uh, parties and the regulations that support cargo move at Jabal Ali are working hand in hand with us to ensure cargo move safely and uh, on timely manner. We do believe that our customers can make a best out of this uh, event. And of course, uh, this year we will have a fantastic gathering and we will all talk about achievements and areas for improvement and opportunities. And we will welcome all of you again uh, this year and next year uh, to this event. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. نتشرف في الأكاديمية العربية للعلوم والتكنولوجيا والنقل البحري بأن نكون الشريك المعرفي الرسمي للإصدار الرقمي الخاص من مؤتمر ومعرض بريك بالك الشرق الأوسط وتتماشى مشاركتنا في هذا الحدث الاستراتيجي مع استعداداتنا للمساهمة في عام الاستعداد للخمسين التي أطلقتها دولة الإمارات بالإضافة إلى مهمتنا الأساسية في تشجيع جيل الشباب كي يكونوا جزءا من هذه الصناعة الواعدة تعد دولة الإمارات مركز شحن عالمي متقدم بأعمال بحرية سنوية تزيد على 280 مليار درهم ولضمان استدامة النمو يجب تعزيز القطاع بالكوادر البشرية المؤهلة لذلك نأمل في الأكاديمية بأن نسد هذه الفجوة عبر تعليم وتأهيل المواهب المحلية الشابة من الفتيان والفتيات نسعى جاهدين في فرع الأكاديمية العربية للعلوم والتكنولوجيا والنقل البحري في الشارقة إلى تعزيز الصناعة البحرية ودعم مكانة الإمارات كمركز علمي للأبحاث العلمية المتقدمة والابتكار في صناعة النقل البحري لذلك تعد شراكاتنا مع الفعاليات الرائدة مثل مثل بريك بالك الشرق الأوسط ذات أهمية حيث يشتهر بتشجيع العقول الشابة خطوة لمنحهم الفرصة للتعلم من الخبراء والمتخصصين ومن خلال التعاون مع مختلف الهيئات الحكومية مثل وزارة الطاقة والبنية التحتية ووزارة التغير المناخي والبيئة في دولة الإمارات نسعى إلى تحفيز نمو صناعة مزدهرة ومستدامة ودعم الاقتصاد الأزرق في دولة الإمارات التزاما منا لتحقيق النمو للصناعة البحرية من الضروري أن نعمل على دمج النساء في القوى العاملة لدينا وهنا نفخر بالإعلان عن أن 43% من طلاب الأكاديمية لدينا هن من النساء مما يجعلها أعلى نسبة من الطالبات في أي أكاديمية بحرية في العالم العربي وبصفتنا في فرع الشارقة ذراع التعليم البحري لدولة الإمارات فإننا نأمل أن نخدم الصناعة البحرية من خلال إمدادها بالمواهب والكفاءات المطلوبة للمساهمة في تطويرها في السنوات القادمة بشكل كبير. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Breakball Middle East Digital Special. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Ben Blamaya, and I am the event director for Breakball Middle East. Sadly, we are not able to be together as planned today. However, we have a brilliant lineup of sessions over the next couple of days to keep connected and bridge the gap until Breakball Middle East returns to the Dubai World Trade Center on the 1st and 2nd of February, 2022. We really appreciate the support and the engagement that we have received from our Breakball community over the past year, and we are looking forward to being together again as soon as we can. Breakball Middle East remains the largest gathering of project cargo professionals in the region, and we are working on exciting new projects 
to ensure that this event remains the go-to meeting place for our industry and our fantastic region. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the UAE Ministry of Infrastructure and Energy for their continued support and patronage, our host port, DP World UAE Region, and our sponsors, Abu Dhabi Ports, Miko Logistics, Agility, MSC, and Alphutame Logistics. Thank you again for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy the remaining few sessions and look forward to welcoming you back to Breakbulk Middle East in 2022. Stay safe and take care. So thank you so much to all of our speakers for their remarks and for their ongoing support. So I know one of the biggest questions for the entire industry is around the project landscape and what this looks like moving forward after the challenges of 2020. So to provide a Middle East project overview, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Ed James, who is the Director of Content and Analysis at Mead Projects. Edward James, I'm the Director of Content and Analysis at Mead Projects and today it's my pleasure to be able to give you a brief overview of the projects market in the GCC, looking at the performance of the market during the difficult 2020 and then looking at 2021 and further ahead uh, as to how the market will perform going forward. So um, let's start by just explaining where the data from this presentation today is coming from. There is a lot of data here. Um, it is quite data intensive and it's all coming from Mead Projects. Mead Projects is an online project tracking tool. Uh, we are tracking more than 15,000 active projects in the MENA region. And by tracking projects, we're able to quantify uh, the trends and size of markets in various sectors. So all the data today is coming from uh, meadprojects.com. So let's start uh, by looking at the historical market for project spending in the GCC. As you can see here in this graph, there have been uh, approximately um, $1.4 trillion worth of projects awarded in the six GCC states over the last 10 years. We reached a peak in um, uh, 2015, 2014 of about $170 billion. We then, of course, uh, saw a decline in project spending uh, due to lower oil prices as governments were able, uh, spent less money on projects due to lower revenues. And unfortunately, in 2020, we actually reached a record low of just under $64 billion, uh, primarily as a result of the pandemic and also as a secondary cause of um, falling oil prices last year as the demand for crude fell quite considerably. So we saw approximately 40% fall year on year in project awards, um, perhaps not very surprising uh, given what happened last year and in line with many other industries. So it was a difficult year uh, last year. And um, just let's look at the largest markets over the last decade before looking at last year's performance on the country level. We can see that the two largest project markets in the GCC are by some margin, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Again, no surprise, they are the two largest economies in the region. They have the two largest populations as well. Uh, but these have, the, have been the, uh, historically over the last decade, the two most significant project markets offering the most opportunities uh, for companies. Uh, nonetheless, although the uh, project markets in other GCC states are considerably smaller, they are also significant project markets in their own right, uh, between 100 and $200 billion of major projects awarded in the last decade. So let's see how each market was affected last year. So while it's true to say that 2020 saw a big fall across the GCC in projects market activity, actually on a country by country level, uh, it wasn't quite the, the same picture. We can see here uh, that Saudi Arabia and UAE being the two largest markets also saw the largest fall in projects activity. And Saudi Arabia fell by more than half in terms of contract awards, which 
might be quite surprising for some. Um, and the UAE also fell um, to about 50% of its uh, 2020, 2019 levels, apologies. And so both markets are still the largest uh, projects markets in the region, unless they have um, fallen quite considerably uh, in 2020. On the other hand, Egypt, Qatar, Iraq, Oman, Algeria, Kuwait, fairly stable, flat by comparison. So when we are looking at 2020, we're not necessarily um, saying across the board, all countries were equally affected. In fact, in some cases, some country mar uh, markets actually grew last year, year on year, uh, albeit for much lower base uh, than the two uh, largest markets of Saudi Arabia, UAE. Now let's look at that same data for the past decade and look at it by sector rather than by country. You can see here quite clearly that the largest single project sector by significant margin is construction. So that's villas, offices, malls, hotels, schools, hospitals, universities, and so forth, uh, with more than $500 billion worth of contracts awarded over the last uh, 10 years or so. Next, we have transport, uh, which is um, less than half of the size of the construction market, about $250 billion. That's roads, ports, airports, railways, and so forth. Then oil and gas, of course, um, combined over uh, $350 billion worth of contracts in the last decade. Power to clean renewable energies, which have grown significantly in the last five years or so, uh, nearly $150 billion. And then water, industrial and chemical making, um, rounding up the other sectors. And again, uh, when we're looking at the performance in 2020 compared with 2019, actually, uh, again, it's a different picture when you're looking at individual sectors. So while it's true, again, that the overall market fell quite considerably, 2020 on a sector level, it was a slightly different story. The larger sector, construction was also the sort of the biggest fall, maybe 50%, uh, more than $30 billion fall year on year and um, a considerable decline. Um, likewise, gas, oil, industrial also fell a significant amount on uh, 2019 levels. On the other hand, we, saw tr we can see that transport actually grew last year, likewise with power sector and water was somewhat flat. So again, it's not necessarily the same story on a sector by sector basis, um, but on a country level, uh, again, like the country levels, um, some sectors have been hit harder than others. Now let's put that data into a bit more concrete uh, projects and actually what happened uh, on a project by project basis last year. Uh, here is a list of um, some selected major projects awarded in the region uh, over the last, uh, over last 12 months. You can see here a wide variety of different types of projects in different sectors, as well as in different markets. You can see Saudi, all GCC states represented here. We have um, uh, defense projects. We've got uh, innovation and academic campus in Abu Dhabi. We've got wastewater schemes, uh, solar power projects, uh, airport schemes, real estate, and so on. So you can see that GCC, as you've seen from the previous data, is a quite diverse market across all markets and all types of sectors just to give you an indicator of some of the projects that are awarded last year. So how's 2021 going to perform? So while it's true that 2020 was a pretty bad year all rounds, uh, what we've actually seen is a large backlog of tenders and contracts now be delayed into 2021. And this means that all those contracts which should have been awarded in the project market in 2020 have now been shifted instead into 2021. And this has created quite a large backlog. And in terms of the value of projects out to bid, where the tender has actually been issued, where uh, bids have been submitted in many cases, you can see that there's actually a very significant pipeline of projects. In Saudi Arabia and the UAE combined, we have nearly $80 billion worth of contracts uh, in tender and in many cases in, in, in under valuation. Um, that's more than all of the GCC states last year combined. So that's quite promising. And even and then across in Oman, 25 billion, in Qatar, um, more than 22 billion, in Kuwait, $20 billion. Again, we're adding another 
50, $60 billion of additional contracts. So when we add that all up, we're well over $120 billion worth of contracts to be uh, awarded uh, in 2021, which will be a significant uplift on last year's numbers and uh, more like the 2018, 2019 uh, figures. So the market, if all goes to plan uh, and schedule is set to rebound quite nicely this year. Of course, many things can happen and many projects do get delayed. But nonetheless, this is indicative of the likely performance uh, over the next 12 months. And again, just to highlight uh, what constitutes that data and some of the key projects currently out in the market, out to bid, just to give you an idea of some of those significant projects this year. Well, it's led by the one of the world's largest projects, which is the LNG uh, processing trains and additional capacity in Qatar. We've got this very major ADNOC hail and gasha sour gas project should be awarded this year as well in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we've got big power and water plants across the region. Uh, we've got um, the world's tallest tower, which has been out for bid for quite some time now, could potentially be awarded this uh, year in Dubai. And um, we've got a range of other uh, significant road, um, oil and gas, pipeline, uh, power and water projects as well uh, coming up uh, in the region. So that's 2021. What about going further ahead? Well, we've seen um, nearly $1.5 trillion worth of projects awarded over the last 10 years. And it's, it's um, very positive to say that the pipeline going forward over the next five to 15 years in terms of the um, horizon for the award of these projects is ne worth nearly $2.5 trillion. Again, this pipeline of projects of announced and planned and unawarded projects is led by Saudi Arabia at just over $1.2 trillion, of course, led by the $500 billion Neom New City project in the far north west of the kingdom. We then have the UAE at more than $700 billion of known projects in the pipeline. And again, followed uh, by uh, in a, in, in, at a distance, but still significant in their own right, by Kuwait, Qatar, and Oman, of between 100 and 200 billion dollars worth of projects in their pipeline. Of course, not all these projects will eventually be awarded. Some will be delayed. Some will be cancelled. Um, but also, at the same time, it's true to say that a lot of projects will be announced and added to this uh, to the pipeline over time. So. Um, it is even if 50% of this pipeline proceeds and ultimately gets in, get, ends up getting awarded, that's still uh, more than $1.2 trillion worth of projects um, over the next 10 years or so. So still a very positive outlook for the region. And finally, just taking that data, um, looking at it by uh, sector, uh, again, uh, in keeping with the historical trend, the largest sector going forward, it will be construction at more than $1.5 trillion of known future projects. Then by transport, nearly $400 billion, power, uh, more than $150 billion, and then other sectors uh, rounding that off. So um, still, again, uh, not only on a country level, but on a sector basis, there is a large diversification and broad mix of projects going forward, which provides a lot of optimism and hope uh, for uh, the market going forward. And then, again, just a sample of some of the major projects coming up in the longer uh, over the next decade or so, of course, we've got NEOM, we've got nuclear power program in Saudi Arabia, we've got road and new uh, projects, new airports, new residential city programs, and um, a lot, again, a wide mix, a wide mix, and across many different countries uh, and uh, different sectors. So again, something for everyone uh, in the years to come. So thank you very much for your attention. It has been a difficult uh, 12 months, unsurprisingly, for the projects market, uh, but we expect a quick uh, rebound this year. And again, uh, looking forward longer term, the pipeline is still very positive. The drivers for project market activity, be they population growth, or economic growth, or the need to invest in infrastructure, still exist, still uh, driving that market forward. And so we could be hopeful uh, for uh, many years to come of the GCC providing a broad range uh, and exciting range of project opportunities. Uh, my name is Edward James, uh, Director of Content Analysis at Me Projects. Thank you very much. And um, I look forward to being able to speak to you all again very soon. Thank you.
thank you so much to Ed for his insights, which provide a great overview of the project outlook for the region, and also the perfect segue into our panel, who will discuss how they are looking to navigate the Middle East project and business landscape in a post-COVID world. I would like to introduce you to our moderator for the session, who will in turn introduce our panelists. So over to Guillermo Cobello, who is the regional CEO for Technicus Reunidas, and also the president of the Spanish Business Council in the UAE. Thank you very much, Liz. It's a pleasure to be here today with you all. Uh, it's an honor to be the moderator of this panel. Uh, after the panel, we will have some questions and answers, and I will be more than happy to put our, all our speakers on the spot just to give you the proper answer that you're needed. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, Guillermo. Good afternoon and to all of you and thank you for watching from home, from work, regardless where you're based here in the UAE, in the GCC or the rest of the world. Welcome to the Breakbelt Middle East Digital Edition Special Panel. Today we will openly discuss about how to navigate the Middle East projects and business landscape in a post-COVID world. And in order to do so, it's an honor for me to introduce the panelists that are going to sell with us through this interesting topic. Mr. Mohamed Jaber, Chief Operating Officer and Regional Director of Project Logistics for the Region of Middle East and Africa for Agility and Breakbold Middle East Program Advisory Board. Good afternoon, Mr. Mohammed. Good afternoon. Captain Mohammed Alali, Senior Vice President, Ship Management, Atmos Logistics and Services and Breakbold Middle East Program Advisory Board. Good afternoon, Captain. Good afternoon, Kuel. And last but not least, Mr. Khalid Al Marsuki. Director Commercial, Khalifa Industrial Zone, Abu Dhabi. Good afternoon, Mr. Hali. Good afternoon. My name is Guillermo Covello. I'll welcome once again to the Breakbolt Middle East Digital Edition Special Panel. All of us have been listening carefully to the previous presentation of Mr. Edward James, Director of Content and Analysis Med Projects. Based not only on the market behavior to this last challenging year, but on the forecast estimations for the near future. All the people that is watching us will be really interested on in hearing about the grand reality, the hands-on work. Therefore, it will be really fruitful to discuss about how your business has been impacted and the ways that you are taking lessons learned from 2020 to look ahead to new opportunities 2021. Of course, we can forget about risk mitigation and cost efficiency. And also, a must to have points, digitalization, innovation, and sustainability. The spirit of this panel is to have an open debate about the different topics I have just mentioned. And in order to do so, I will be asking different questions to our panelists to cover all our agenda. Nevertheless, Mr. Mohammed, Captain Mohammed, and Mr. Khalid, please feel free to jump in when you consider it appropriate. My first question is to you, Captain. Mohammed, while many of you argue whether COVID-19 is over, how do you see the short-term and long-term recovery post-COVID-19? Thank you, Colm. Actually, the, uh, the COVID-19, uh, it's as you said, it's not over. Uh, we're still going through the pandemic and uh, there has been a number of waves uh, and, and we have uh, you know, been building experience of how to actually move forward. Uh, I believe, you know, uh, in the short term, uh, we will be, um, you know, uh, trying to gear ourselves up into uh, ramping up our um, uh, projects and, and trying to um, uh, catch up to whatever we have deferred from last year in terms of investments. As, as you, you can see, there has been a lot of uh, investments. I wouldn't say all has been cancelled, but a lot of it was deferred and deferred mainly due to the change of the demand in this. Um, so this this would be, uh, I think, a priority to, to actually uh, look into all these uh, deferred investments and how we can actually phase them in the way forward. Then the long term is actually to look into how the whole demand is going to shape in the uh, way forward as well and and um, what sort of changes is actually happened to our industry and, and again th that we have to revise our five-year ten-year strategic plans accordingly and in, in terms of uh, logistics segments uh, you know in ad logistics and services um, 
while we have been, you know, uh, uh, investing, uh, you know, very thoughtful in, in a way that we are, you know, building up our fleet, we, we are building up our logistic uh, supply chain capability. Uh, nevertheless, we have been, in fact, uh, impacted by the pandemic and mainly towards uh, delivering our service to clients. And this is something that we are carefully looking into in the short term, how we are able to uh, build up our uh, capability to manage with our seafarers and how they are, as you know, being stranded on the, on the vessels and how we are able to, uh, to, to uh, ensure the safety and sustainability of our fleet. That's um, in a nutshell my answer. Many thanks, Captain. I mean, it's true. Still, we are being through some ups and downs during these days where we have to use all the tools at our disposal in order to be more efficient. But it leads me to my next question. In this case, to Mr. Mohamed Jaber, uh, how agility benefited from the digitalization during COVID? Uh, thank you, Guermo. Uh, actually, the ag agility started the digitalization quite uh, uh, at early stage and before COVID. But the digitalization was an essential and important part of our business continuity plan uh, since the pandemic started. Uh, the pandemic, unfortunately, it's driven home all the urgency and important and the importance of, of uh, working remotely and, and, and the importance of digitalized supply chain. Online platform gave us as the ability to get a 360 degrees view and, and just instantly the variables in capacity, scheduling, pricing and documentation. Agility has used the digital tools to keep trade uh, flowing Every day we work with our customers and to find shipping and uh, shipping uh, means of shipping and uh, warehousing capacity across the world, especially for BBEs, for projects cargo and uh, 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 food and beverage. Keeping customers informed and about the status of their cargo, the consolidation and uh, uh, customer clearance warehousing across the world. Uh, the pandemic separated digital leaders from Legos. Leaders had tools and make uh, data-driven decisions quickly because they had trusted business and trusted supply chain partners. The, the, those could be a freight forwarders or uh, 3BL service providers, but sharing fresh information in near real time and hunting down available production and shipping capacities. It's obvious lesson learned from pandemic is that the digital capabilities and, uh, and, and such as predictive modeling, big data and uh, 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 digital capabilities will provide uh, a lot of uh, stability to the decisions and how the supply chain uh, uh, across the world, not whenever you look into it within a country, but for the entire door to door supply chain. Agility Ventures uh, is is uh, is one of our it's our venture arms, which partnering with a lot of startups who are championing technologies that can build faster and more secure and more sustainable supply chain. And our platform uh, launched big time with the um, digital platform Shiba Freight, uh, and it helped a lot of people to perform their business from home, from uh, 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 their location as it's uh, as as. Uh, usual life day to day. So thanks to digitalization and Internet of Things that enable us to at least be stronger with the COVID situation uh, during 2020 and it's growing in digitalization during 2021 as the pandemic yet to be normalized. Thanks a lot, Mr. Mohammed. Definitely uh, digitalization had play. It's playing and it will play a major role not only on our businesses, but even in our uh, normal lives. So uh, I really appreciate it indeed, all this feedback that you are providing. Uh, Mr. Halit, in this case, as commercial director from KISAT, from your perspective, what are the main challenges and impacts from COVID-19 that is going on on 2021? Uh, so first of all, uh, we have to know that uh, Definitely, the pandemic has changed everything around us, uh, including, of course, the business environment. 
Now, some changes were positive, some unfortunately were negative. Uh, we saw uh, sectors that are growing faster than before, and we saw other suffering. So those challenges generate, uh, I will not say new trends, rather than actually enhance business trends where companies had to adapt to the changes. So we see nowadays more uh, competitions in the supply chain, in the supply chain management, supply chain channels. Especially when we speak about international companies, they had to search for the optimal way to reach to their uh, customers. Today, e-commerce became, uh, I believe, a mandatory approach to survive for some companies. Uh, I'll give a few examples now, like in Kizad, for example, we see that the warehousing demand during the pandemic has been growing up. We were able to lease all out our uh, inventory which is equivalent to around 2 million uh, square feet of warehousing to meet the demand. And uh, today we are actually, uh, uh, we are currently developing a 5 million uh, square feet of warehouse solutions, including cold and cold uh, storage. So this is all showing you now the importance of what we call uh, local strategy, where the company has to make sure that they will be able to uh, meet the demand in different country in the world. Now, uh, the international companies uh, nowadays give more attention to the importance, for example, of using technology to reach to the customer. Uh, also, as I mentioned, having a base uh, close to their consumer market. Uh, now, another challenge that we see here during the pandemic was actually the manufacturing companies on having an access to the uh, raw material. Some companies start to focus more on integrations, the supply chain, in order to reduce the inventory loss, while many had to shrink the capacity. Uh, for us in Kizad uh, and in Abu Dhabi in general, we were fortunate that we already have created uh, the approach of what we call cluster approach for different sectors, different industries. For example, in Kizad, we have now metal clusters, food cluster, uh, automotive clusters. So having the upstream and the downstream uh, within one locations, and of course, having the, the right connectivity, the needed connectivities through ports with the seaports, airports, and other, uh, other channels. So this is our very important actually for the companies now to face uh, the pandemic. I believe now that the break bulk sectors post-COVID-19 will accelerate its digital transform via automations and uh, intelligent technology. Thank you, Mr. Khalid. So I just got a key points, local strategy, flexible, dynamic, e-commerce, and a cluster approach. And thank you for sharing the challenges uh, that you have seen from your position. So that leads me back to the captain. Despite one year passed since the pandemic started, there are no solutions to the concerns related to the stranded seafarers. How this will impact in the supply chain moving forward, Captain? I think uh, the issue about the seafarers is getting uh, uh, ever more serious because um, uh, there's no solution in place. Um, while there was, you know, uh, isolated initiatives from different governments, but there is no worldwide solution. This is. Uh, you know, uh, not. Uh, I mean, many people do not really feel the impact today because the seafarers continue to serve, continue to work hard, continue to sacrifice their well-being for the um, b best of the of the economy of the world. Nevertheless, I think uh, one day these seafarers will lose patience, and and this is going to have a major impact on the whole world economy when vessels are being stopped and are not uh, actually delivering the goods to the countries. In UAE, uh, we are very grateful. We have a very great leadership. We were very proactive and we have opened the opportunity for uh, seafarers uh, to be changed over. So the, the, we have somehow relieved uh, some of the pressure in this region. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we need a worldwide solution. From Adnoc Logistics and Services, we have signed the Neptune Declaration, uh, which is uh, have been in the media recently. Uh, to, to actually announce our uh, full commitment and support to the seafarers 
and uh, we have uh, you know uh, spared no efforts to to support them no matter whatever the cost is because their well-being and, and and safety comes first so we hope that you know we will come to a resolution soon and uh, with the best efforts of all the governments otherwise the, the the economy of the world will be very much impacted if this is being uh, overlooked or uh, ignored Thank you very much, Captain and Adnok, for the support to the seafarers. Indeed, appreciate it. In addition to that, I would like to ask to Mr. Mohamed Jabber in this case, from your perspective, how COVID impacts the supply chain, sea and air? Uh, actually, as we reference to uh, need projects presentation, we see there is a big drop in the projects in the region, uh, uh, um, led by the biggest two economies here, Saudi Arabia and UAE, then followed by Oman, Kuwait, there is a big drop. So the, there is a big imbalance of the cargo moving across the world. Today we see like thousands of dollars increasing on the on the containers rate due to the imbalance uh, and congestions as well as blank sailings. The uh, uh, one of the three containers is rolled now, right now in Long Beach in, in the United States. If you look into our region, the premiums and surcharges are hitting so, so aggressive. Despite of that, the, there is a huge peak on the on the air freight movement due to moving BBE and, and vaccines and uh, food. However, due to the lack of uh, uh, the, the usual capacity of, uh, of passenger flights, that put a lot of pressure on air freight. Uh, the, uh, the impact driven into the supply chain, how to be able to match between the production and, and vessels and the demand on the ongoing projects, which suffer a lot of, of force majeure and delays on their schedules. The, the ability to have a visibility across the board was really challenging, but uh, I, I think today, I believe on, on, on very, very maybe meaningful statement that survival is not for the fittest, but for the fastest in adaptation. Uh, thanks to God, if you're looking to UAE, to Saudi Arabia, even to Kuwait, to Oman, to our Middle East region, we and, and part of Africa as well, we are very conscious and very adaptive. The cases start when going down, the government provide full support to the economy at all sectors. As well, the vaccination program is going uh, uh, at all levels in many places in, in, in the region. Uh, in Abu Dhabi and UAE, we are in, in very advanced stage on adaptation and being able to dance with the problem rather than fighting it. And we finding our ways to adapt, uh, working with Makta uh, Gateway, which is one of uh, uh, the, the, the clusters and the automation and digitalization uh, 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 efforts to, to build a blockchain uh, uh, programs and uh, mining data and 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 uh, master uh, data science allows us all of us in terms of Adnoc LNS, which is the biggest provider for Adnoc, or the the ports, which is the major infra infrastructure, or and EBC like uh, uh, like what all the EBCs do in the market. That kind of reinforcing each other in a blockchain helped us a lot, especially in UAE, to overcome those challenges and at least be more adapting to those challenges more than a lot of other economies. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, you remind me just this Darwinism theory that is not the strongest that survived, the one that adapts fastest to the change, right? So I think it's a little bit aligned what you were saying. Uh, going back to you, Mr. Halit, from the perspective of KISAD, uh, and talking about new opportunities that are appearing and now into the table, uh, what are the project and impact on new markets opening, like for example, Israel? Uh, UAE is is, uh, is a well known to be the, I believe, the preferred logistic hub in this region in this part of the world, and to connect the east and the west and vice versa. So, opening any new markets, I believe, is actually means is actually expanding the consumer uh, basket actually uh, for our customers. Now, uh, speaking, uh, you highlight, uh, me, let, let me give you examples of Israel since you mentioned them. So for Israel, I, uh, I saw that there's some statistics show that the new agreement will open or facilitate the entry 
for Israeli company to more than uh, 100 ca countries in the world. Uh, in Kizat, in Abu Dhabi ports two months ago, we have signed a MOU with the manufacturing associations of Israel to develop the trade, investment, and uh, technology. Now, the agreement in, uh, aims to enhance the opportunity, especially in the field of the research, development, industrial uh, corporations, and of course, knowledge transfers between uh, our entity and their entity. So here, what we are trying to do is actually supporting, first of all, uh, as our objective, supporting our main uh, sectors, which is actually the pharma agriculture sectors by using the advance and uh, as you know that Israel is, is actually a leader when it comes to the technology. Today we have uh, in discussions with different companies, uh, private sectors, uh, public sectors uh, and from Israel in order actually for them to get the opportunities in, in being part of the of those projects that is being developed uh, nowadays in Abu Dhabi. Thank you very much, Mr. Halid. Uh, gentlemen, our time is almost over, uh, but let me ask you la la last quick round of questions. So going back to you, Mr. Mohamed Javer, uh, efficiency. How can we bring more efficiency uh, to our projects through technology? How can we be applied? Let brief us a little bit about that, please. Uh, actually, uh, we identified that there is four important technologies currently in the world that everybody working in the supply chain has to focus on them, which is blockchain, Internet of Things, uh, uh, robotic uh, uh, process automation, and data science. Those, like Abu Dhabi, one of the advanced countries through Makta Gateway, and now Agility working with MERS and IBM for blockchain initiative, that will help all over the market to reduce uh, cost, increase efficiencies, and stop using the data to alert exceptions, but start using the data to prevent the exceptions. It's not about how you manage the present, it's about how, how about, it's all about how to anticipate the future and manage the risk at the future. Sh shifting our operation from managing risk, uh, managing emergencies into managing risk. Thanks a lot, Mr. Mohammed. Well, it's true. Nowadays, efficiency is not only a word, it's an action that we should be taking every single day. Captain, uh, very quick, company like Adnoc, a reference worldwide, a leader to follow. Uh, are we going through various waves of the pandemic? What are the main lessons learned and how can we face the next waves on a more efficient manner? I think, um, you know, we, we identified the challenges and we understood exactly what the pandemic actually is. is uh, really uh, requires for uh, from us to, to face it properly. We should not exaggerate. We should not really go over the top and we should not also be complacent. We should really approach it in a very uh, practical manner whereby we can protect the country's best interest and we will sustain business in a safe manner. I think one of the best lessons learned out of all the whole experience is that we need to find opportunities during these challenges. This is the time where we actually need to really partner with uh, each other, where, where we actually want to grow our business, learn from each other, share our technology, and in order for us to get through this pandemic safely. So uh, we are, you know, in Adnoc working very uh, aggressively towards, you know, partnering in order to provide the best solution and best service to our customers. And this is, you know, it's, it's you will see more and more of this is in the in the future from Adnoc Logistics and Service in particular because. Providing the solution, the most, uh, this will uh, enable us not only to um, uh, leverage on the technology, but also to provide the best efficiency and reduce costs for our customers. Thanks, Captain. And to finalize our panel, Mr. Halit, if you want to add something else that you consider appropriate, just to wrap up uh, before we leaving, now is the moment. No, actually, I think we had the great sessions. We have covered uh, many parts. And now, uh, now most of the of the subjects now is going through that pandemics and uh, I think anyway uh, I would like to speak about UAE that we have actually showing actually uh, kind of like a model for the world how to face such pandemics and how actually to create those challenges to business opportunities and we have seen actually uh, growing the news many things that being talking uh, every day here in UAE and we are very happy actually to be 
part of such a developed country. Thanks, Mr. Halley. Well, dear panelists, thank you very much for your time. I think that we have been able to cover important topics as market situation, trends, challenges, outlook for the future, digitalization, innovation, and efficiencies. It has been an honor and a pleasure to enjoy this panel together. And now is the time to open the panel to all those participants that are watching and would like to pick up your brain for the next 10 minutes. So it's the time for the question and answer. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our panel for a truly fascinating discussion. And we are lucky enough to have them joining us live now to answer some of your questions. Um, so I can see Guillermo is here. If we have, could our other panelists please join the stage and we can answer your questions now. So over to you, Guillermo. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, yes, now is the question, uh, time for the question and answer. Uh, just take advantage of our top-notch speakers. They will be more than happy to answer for the next 10 minutes. Uh, that's the good part. The best part is that they will do it for free. So please I encourage all of you that has not been very active on the chat of question and answer uh, to go there and, and just click on the question that you wanted to answer by the speakers. Uh, in any case, uh, I think I, I will start from my own. Um, in, this, in this particular occasion with Mohamed Jaber. Uh, Mohamed, you mentioned that the survival uh, will go to the fastest and the most adaptive. Uh, where do you see agility here? Uh, any particular capability most important? Uh, thank you, Guermo. Uh, I, I think uh, it's, it, it is very important how we can uh, be able to reduce cost and uh, and increase efficiency and optimization through using the edge of technology. Uh, uh, maybe everybody here in the news, we just placed a thousand truck order for the fuel cell trucks, which will be able to reduce uh, the cost per, per kilometer around 30%. And that's not something can be achieved by uh, uh, easily, but through technology. At the same time, we we just uh, start our uh, phase one of using drone, and now it, they, are, they are in implementation phase for inventory count, for uh, uh, managing part of the supply chain, and, and soon they will be launched for uh, uh, light and medium uh, weight uh, transportation, which will help uh, also our customers and the trade and the industry to be able to reduce the cost and the level of error and there would be a lot driven by uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, and technologies. Thanks, Mr. Mohammed. Uh, I can see that Mr. Khalid is here. Uh, Khalid, how do you see Kisat working with Israel and is the agriculture the only sector or is just the first sector for Kisat? Mr. Khalid? I think we're having some technical issue. Uh, nevertheless, I, I will continue chatting with you, Mr. Uh, Mohammed, uh, because it's clear that um, at the end of the day, um, uh, agility has been able to adapt fast to the changes uh, you have mentioned. Uh, maybe we can go a little bit more into the detail uh, in relation to how can you have achieved being efficient during this COVID time? Actually, uh, uh, we, we give a lot of focus on the uh, four important technology, technologies right now in the market that we believe that everybody in supply chain also should, should focus on them. It's between the blockchain, Internet of Things, data science, and uh, robotic process automation. Those are re uh, uh, reinforcing each other, and it has been implemented in a lot of our uh, sectors. As I mentioned earlier, there's a, a big uh, uh, collaboration between Maersk and IBM and Agility Abu Dhabi with Maqta uh, 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 Bridge. Now, the Maqta Gateway, for example, now integrating the whole supply chain for vaccine transportation, which is the hottest topic in, in, in the region. Agility collaborating with Maqta uh, Gateway 
to enter to to give visibility to the governments and the end users and to the market how this uh, sensitive operation going to move all over the places with our recent experiences on moving vaccines as well into like our uh, platform of Shiba Freight which anybody can go and put all his uh, uh, logistics requirement and he got instant quote or maybe if it's special equipment he will get a quote automated without interference through uh, uh, online uh, the the importance of using those technologies all together we believe in in the next decade who will not be able to uh, apply them and use them uh, uh, very well he will be suffering a, a quite challenging time on and being uh, competitive and protect his market share even to to grow thank you mr mohammed i can see that mr halid is, is now here uh, Mr. Halid, I was asking you before, how do you see KISAT working with Israel and is the agricultural sector uh, the only one or is it just the first sector? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry for this uh, technical issues. Uh, actually, funny story, uh, just like one hour ago, I had a visit also from the Israeli uh, company that uh, visited KISAT and we were, uh, it's actually a consulting company from Israel. They have been working here for over 30 years via their uh, their entity in UK, and we were work we are discussing about like the same questions that you are raising about like most most of the, our focus is actually going through technology and agri tech and agriculture and the food sub. So what about the other sectors? So one of the one of the sectors that was very excited from the Israel part that we can focus on in the future was actually the polymers polymer sectors. Uh, they already uh, highlighted number of companies that actually we can uh, go uh, forward and start to showcase Abu Dhabi and the value propositions that we can provide to them. So uh, we have, as I mentioned, discussed the polymers and also there were uh, different sectors, but most of the sectors we are talking about require the high uh, technology. So they are not only in the agriculture uh, sectors. We also discuss about the automotive, about the pharma. Pharma, pharma as you know, it's very big sectors in uh, Israel. So we, we, we actually believe that someday we need to create kind of like innovations hub for the Israeli to be based here anyway. Thank you, Mr. Halid. Um, now, now that uh, we have you here, and I think that uh, this next question is quite important because probably there is a large number of viewers and listeners that are working not for these big companies, but the small and medium enterprises. So what's what the situation with these SMEs during 2020 and what are the steps did Kisat to help them? Uh, well, uh, see, in Kizad in general, we have uh, what we call the SME Center within the Kizad, and this was established uh, several, years ago, uh, several years ago with different uh, values, uh, and we are trying to support those companies to start small uh, and getting advantage with all, uh, the, I would say, the business networking that Abu Dhabi provides to them, access to the projects that within Abu Dhabi, within UAE for this, SME company using our platform in 2020 once the COVID-19 hits what we did actually we start actually to create a package that we believe that will make uh, their business more sustainable uh, in terms of cost wise in terms of the regulations uh, so we work uh, very closely with the SME and we understand that this SME drive almost 70 percent you spoke about israel and israel every time we speak to them they said 90 percent of the companies we have is SME, sme so our focus is going very strongly to the sme in the last years and we have tried to implement as much as like i would say uh, professional uh, practice uh, uh, globally which uh, that can support them to be established within abu dhabi and from there expand their business and scale to uh, a new level Thank you very much, Mr. Khalid, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mohammed. It's time to finalize our question and answer. Thanks uh, to you, the panelists. Thank to all the people that has been listening and watching. And I have to, I want to say something. In less than five hours, the Hope Probe will be orbitating around Mars, thanks to the UE Mars mission. That should be a reminder that no matter what challenge or difficulty we have in front of us, if we work together, if we are together, 
We can overcome every situation. We can achieve whatever we propose. Have a good afternoon and keep an eye on the Red Planet. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much, Guillermo, and thank you to all of our speakers and supporters today, as well as everyone behind the scenes who came together to make this session happen. As mentioned, it will be available on demand on our website, so do feel free to contact me as well if you have any other questions at all. My email address is at the top of the chat box now. So on that note, we hope to see you all very soon and do take care. Thanks very much for joining.